Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Inside the Birds platform on the YouTube channel. This is Jason Avant, and this is the Q&A show, my partner in crime, the one with all the wisdom, DB secondary, uh, anything over there, drawing up plays. My man, Quentin Michael, say what's up to the people, Q. What's up, everybody? Good to be back. Let's let's have some fun, man. It's always a good time when I get to see, get to spend some time talking football with you, and so I'm excited to get going, man. All right, I'm going to be sweating here a little bit. Uh, you know, it's a little hot in this house, a little air, air conditioning not working and working right, but, you know, normal problems. So if I start sweating everywhere, don't worry about it. Just mind your business, mind your business, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to say thank you guys um, for, you know, making this show a success. Everyone that's submitting questions um, at insidethebirds at gmail.com. Everyone that's giving questions to Instagram, Instagram Facebook, Twitter, Whatever, wherever it may be, um, Amazon Music, thank you guys for tuning in. We just want to say thank you guys for all of the support. Thank you to um, everyone that's responsible, to, to Jeff and Adam and, and Hunter and Josh and Jim, whoever is responsible. We really appreciate you guys, and we're trying to take this show to the next level. We're always excited, and we have some good news today, some Eagles training camp news. We're going to cover some of the questions at the end of the show. Um, as we get closer to the seasons, we're going to kind of taper down the questions. Um, we're going to start focusing on some of the training camp previews, the battles, the depth, those types of things. And this upcoming week, there was big news in the Twitter world where Steven Nelson said that he was going to make his decision on which team he's going to sign with over the next couple of days. We thought it would happen today before this show so we can talk about it. It did not happen today. But Q, what do you think? Um, he could add to the Eagles if we get Steven Nelson, a veteran savvy corner, small guy, but feisty. We've seen this player over and over again in the National Football League. One of those guys that you just can't get out of the league. You can't get rid of him because he's just so scrappy. Not the most talented, but a dog. You know, you wish you had players like him on the team. Do you think he's going? You think he can make us better? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you look at if you look at our, our uh, secondary right now, he definitely can step in and help. And and I think where he helps the most is having experience and um, someone that's been there before. Um, obviously, a lot of, we're we're saying a lot about our our entire defense. I mean, we got mm -hmm. Kerrigan. Um, we added um, um, Zach Wilson, uh, Zach Wilson, Craig James. Mm -hmm. um, just mm -hmm. guys that have kind of been around and and um, just kind of been part of the part of the NFL for a while. So to me right now, Eric I think Wilson. I said that exactly. Eric, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, if we can, if we can get him at the right number now, you know, his last year in, in, um, in, in Pittsburgh, um, he was scheduled to make, I believe around $8 million. Um, they asked him to take a pay cut and uh, he, you know, we'll talk about that in a little bit. I don't know if he, if he knew exactly if it was going to be a definite pay cut or if he was renegotiating, but the, the end of the story is he got released. So, um, mm -hmm. obviously at that number, we can't afford to pay a guy like that, um, $8 million, but if you can get him at a, at a lower price point, mm -hmm. um, you know, he can definitely help. We're talking about a guy, he's, you know, he's not a ball hawk by any means. I mean, he's <clears throat> his entire career. I think he's had seven interceptions. Um, yeah. He's definitely savvy. He can cover, but I'm, if we can get him at the right price, I think he's definitely worth it. And uh, he'll definitely shore up our secondary. Yeah. Um, I agree with you. His number is astronomical. He's not worth that at this age. Um, he's the classic overachiever. He's a really good, a really good competitive corner, a guy that you can trust to compete. The city will mess around and love this type of player. He's like a perfect fit for Philadelphia. Um, he's going to get bodied on some of the some of the down the field balls, but he's a great study, um, great studier. So he played DK William, um, DK Metcalf, uh, not this past year, but the year before, and locked him down pretty good. And they tried him the entire game. I'm talking about maybe 12, 13 targets, and he played really well because he knew that DK Metcalf runs, you know, three routes. Okay, he has the the fade. He has a go, he has a slant, and maybe like a quick screen or something like that. And if he yeah. can study you up and he can stay on top, he's going to be better. So if there's um, tendencies, this is the guy that you can depend on. Now, once you start to move this guy around, you start to put him in space where he's guessing a little bit, it's going to be a little bit tougher for him. But he can make plays on the ball. He's disruptive in that he tips and touches a lot of passes. He doesn't always pick them off because he doesn't have the best hands. But he creates um, 
he's he he disrupts the ball because he's always near it and um he he's not bad and he's not bad and off he's really not yeah, bad and off yeah. and um he reads the three step really well he is a double move candidate however he's more disciplined than our younger guys so i think this is an upgrade at corner it's still nothing to write home about but he is a solid player that yes. still has some um some some talent left in the tank he has a few more years in this league but hats off to steve nelson that was my young boy um and uh in kansas city and he would want to go with go with me every single one-on-one and okay. i'd be like dude i'm tired of beating your your head off <laughs> and uh and, and but no people come up i'm like dude you can't come he used to get pissed off he would get so mad and i and i can tell then that he had the fire to want to to perfect his craft because a guy like him that's undersized under um not the fastest guy not the most talent it's sheer willpower and competitiveness that's keeping him in the league. And usually players like that do well in Philadelphia. So I'm looking forward to um, hearing that news. I think it helps us out tremendously. Now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, but yeah, but and then, the you know, the thing too, and I'm sure you're probably heading towards that too, is the thing that it does, if we do, or if we're able to get him at a good, at a good, you know, contract and get him in there, what it does is now it frees up a spot on the outside. Now we can move Maddox inside. Now you're not you know, relying on rookie Zach McPherson to really kind of, you know, yeah. be that guy right away. So now you can allow him to develop and, you know, there's going to be some bumps and bruises for every rookie, yeah. as you know, rookies, is, it's going to be tough, especially at, at in the secondary, but it'll be, it'll be a better way for him to kind of get some experience and, and slowly work his way into, um, you know, a possible starting road down the line. Yeah. But, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, you're good. Never, never apologize. You know a lot more about secondary than I ever will, so I always concede to your information when it comes to secondary. No, you, you know a lot, man. Yeah, sure. more, not more, more than you. <laughs> <laughs> the the um the next part of this cue is the depth down the line. Say there's a situation we're always you know we're trying to look at the situation and say okay this is the best case scenario trying to get Steven Nelson. If we don't get Steven Nelson. We have a few guys that are fighting for positions. You got Michael Jaquette, you have Craig James, you have Zach, Mc, Zach McPherson, Zach Zach, I can't pronounce his name, but um, you have these guys, you have Avante Maddox, you have a plethora of young guys that, that can step in. Here's the here's the, the, the devil's advocate part to that. Do you bring in this savvy veteran and, and hinder Michael Jaquette's um, you know, opportunity to play? Because he did show a few snaps that he played okay versus DeAndre Hopkins in the first half, and then second half he got you know destroyed, which is young player mistakes. Then he got destroyed, but he's always near the football. Um, so it's one of those things. Do you commit to the progress process? Do you say okay, this year is a rebuilding year, or this is a transitional year, and I'm going to commit to my young guys, or do I say that I'm trying to win the NFC East? And I think that's where your decision lies. Um, if you get um, Steve Nelson or not. I know that they're vying for him, but ultimately, do you want to mess up the opportunity for Zach McPherson, um, you know, Michael Jaquette, or Craig James to get a chance to play this year? So um, what do you think about those guys next? So what I what I think about when you say that is from the beginning, um, Sirianni, his, his, his main thing that he's always been said is competition, competition, competition. Facts. Um, and, and, that holds true. If that holds true for Jalen Hurts as a quarterback, that holds true for uh, Steven Nelson if he brings him in, right? So just because you sign a contract, just because you sign a deal, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to necessarily be starting, right? So if I'm Jaquette, if I'm, um, you know, Josiah Scott, if I'm uh, Zach McPhil McPherson, Craig James, I'm not, I don't even care who you're signing. I'm still competing. I'm going out there to try to win a job, right? Mm -hmm. According to what the coaching staff has said, Everything is up for competition. Everything's up for grabs. You know, yeah. we know as as former players that that might not always be true. But in my mindset, right, in the spirit of competition, I think the mindset's got to be: I don't care who's in front of me. I don't care who they sign. I got to go out there and compete, and I got to go out there and play. So, you know, obviously for us as fans, we'd rather see somebody with some experience in Steven Nelson. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Jack. I can't. I can Zach, never, Zach, never Zach, say that. Zach mm -hmm. The uh, Jaquette. And McPherson doesn't necessarily mean that they're on the way out. So yeah, let's if it's going to be co open competition, let's if we can bring Stephen Nelson in, bring him in, let's compete. So that's why I'm yeah. looking at it, and it can only make everybody better in the long run. Yeah, competition is what he preached. So I, so I um I agree with what you're saying. 
Um, I think it's the only way to go is that you always try to make the team better. You never play for the punt. You never play for um, the possession. You try to score touchdowns, right? So, and that's the game of football. We're trying to win the Super Bowl. So if you can bring in Steven Nelson, you do that to help the team. Talent helps the team at some point. Even if those young guys are on the shelf for a year, them getting schooled up by someone older and seeing what professionalism is about and seeing what um, Pro Bowl level and um, work ethic like Darius Slay has, that's only beneficial to your team. Now, on the other hand, you have these, um, you have these, these young guys and you got a lot of talent there. You and for, for you guys that don't know these players, um, I, I was privy to be there last year, so I kind of know their strengths and their weaknesses besides Zach McPherson. Michael Jaquette wants to be good, really wants – he works at his craft. He stays after with Darius Slay. He's trying to become better. He loses confidence at times just because he's not the athlete that Darius, Darius Slay is. However, he is very, very twitchy. He's a 4-3, low 4-3 guy that can run. And he's big. He just has to learn how to move his feet at the line. He's stone feet, even though he's twitchy. It's, um, he's one of those guys that if he shoots his hands, his feet stop. And that's usually common with bigger players. I don't know what that is. They ended up, They usually end up lunging at you. But bigger players always try to be a little bit more physical. And if their feet stop, they're done. It, it doesn't matter how big you are. You're trying to disrupt the play. You're not trying to Hulk Hogan somebody back in the backfield. <laughs> and I think the younger players usually get that confused. We like to see the YouTube videos of the guy being stuck on the line of scrimmage. Not happening in the pros unless they're just an unaware receiver that's um, um, really slow. But other than that, it's, it's not happening. So um, I like uh, Michael Jaquette's uh, upside. Um, uh, Craig James, special team demon. Um, I, I love guys that transition from special teams because those dudes that are dogs on special teams, he's, he's literally the Eagles' best special teams player as okay. far as covering guys and, and that. Now, he's hurt a lot just because he's is a 4-3 guy that runs fast and have to defeat um, you know, double teams on punt all the time. So they're yanking at you, they're pulling at you. So he has some hamstring problems. But when he has his opportunity to play, he's not bad at all. He's 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 rangy. He's going to make the tackle. Um, I, I think there's a place in the National Football League for a guy like that. When you shine on special teams, usually guys like that end up on defense somewhere. Yeah. And um, hopefully he can show um, that he can stay in the secondary this year. And then I'm looking forward to seeing Zach McPherson. I don't know his talent level. Um, but I want to see. I've heard a lot of great things about him. Um, yeah, um, he ha he has a um, he, he has some 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 ability to get the ball back. I always question Texas Tech guys because there's a transition. Usually they're letting people score on them to get the offense back. So I don't know how competitive those type of guys are. But there's guys that transition from 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 defense. And Jose Del Hanson is coming to my mind right now, but not many others have, have come out of there. But we'll we'll, we'll see. Um, so, hold on. Before we get to that, for the next, I want to ask you a question though, because I'm okay. I'm kind of looking right now, and I'm looking at Jaquette and his size, and I didn't realize he was six one. He's, he got, he's, he's a big six, dude. One, two, three. He's a big dude. Yeah. Is he? Do you think he's a type of player? And I'm thinking because he's he's twitchy, as you say, and you know he's now he can um, run, run. He can, he can run, run, run. He can so run. Do you run. think that he could possibly move to a safety position? You think oh. that that could work eventually? Not maybe not this year, but no. no. You know what? Everyone is everyone. You know, that's like the easy way out for me is like a lot of people that say these corners can play safety. It's different tackling angles. Q, you you yeah. giving yourself too little credit, man. It, 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 you got to have a different mentality when when the players designed to meet somebody in the C gap. You got to come down full speed before that ball gets too much up the field where, you, where the running back has a two way go. You got to be able to meet in the hole. That's a different tackling angle. We Very saw true. early with Jalen Jalen. Um, um, uh, yeah, Jalen Mills last year missing a lot of tackles early just because the angles are different. You Very know, true. so I think that um, he, does he have the ability? Yes, but I don't know if, if, if corners naturally have that mindset. You got to be one of those corners that like to play and like to tackle. Um, like Jalen Mills likes to tackle. It's going to give you the, the bravado and the green hair and the swag. You know what I mean? You're going to have Charles Woodson that lived in the backfield at nickel. Um, guys like uh, Antoine Winfield or Rod Woodson, guys like that that love doing it. Uh, you can't just take a casual corner and just move him to safety. It's just a different tackling mentality. It is, and, and a lot of and you can you got to be good in open field. 
How many times have I seen you save a touchdown? Like, who wants that? Who wants who <laughs> wants the ball to be 10 yards away from the line of scrimmage with you and the three-way go? The guy can stop, start, move over, left, right, do whatever he wants. In some way, you make the play. So I would think that Craig James may be the better option at safety long term as a as a, as a guy rather than Jaquette, because Craig James has the mentality of special teams and making plays. But other than That's that, I, I don't know. That's fair. Nice. Yeah. Like that. Um and, and and the other thing too about Jaquette, um, can can he be a nickel like deep safety like Byron Jones type of player? Um I don't know Jaquette's um uh, like mental makeup and how um, how well he processes information. I know he loses confidence at times, but he's a really good young player. Uh, Byron Jones was always lauded for his ability to process information. And that's what made Bry um, Byron Jones um, for Dallas a little bit different than Jaquette. Um, uh, and he was, he, they had the same similar size, but to move from nickel, to move to outside, to move to safety, you gotta be a person that's assignment pure. And yeah. usually those, and just think about that. How many guys on a team that you can use like that? Very true. That's <laughs> you just you just don't like you have yeah. a few guys here Very and there on offense and defense that you can move to different spots like that because it's so hard to remember everyone's assignment and to be assignment pure with with so many different responsibilities. So being a young player in the National Football League, I think trying to keep him at one spot would be the best situation, not necessarily playing with him in, in multiple spots. Uh, but he does have the size of Byron Jones. Does he have the mental capacity and makeup of Byron Jones? No one knows. Yeah. Well, that's the best part, man. Getting in yeah. the training camp. We'll see what the heck's going on. Yeah, we, we don't know. Um, <laughs> there's the safeties now too, Q. Like, so we just cover, we just cover like the safeties, uh, Avante Maddox, is he going to slot? Um, are we going to use Josiah Scott, one of these young guys at the slot? There's a lot of stuff. And then you got the safeties. We got Rodney that's coming back. You got Anthony Harris, who you signed. You got a young player in Kayvon Wallace. Um, you got Marcus Epps. Um, Andrew Adams. Yeah. What, what do you see these? What do you see? What do you see? What do you see the safeties? What do you see the secondary being like? There's so many questions. And I don't think that this is a strength of the team. I think that the Eagles defense really has one, possibly two, two above, three above average, above average players. Yeah. So looking at the roster, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm the type of person, I'm naturally um, optimistic, but looking at the roster and just kind of looking at, what we have where, all right, so there's usually two train, two uh, trains of thought. Either you build in the secondary or you build, you know, your front, your front mm -hmm. four. And I honestly, we obviously didn't build with the secondary. And so, mm -hmm. but then we look at our front four and yes, they're, they've, they've had very good seasons. Um, there's not a lot of depth. There's not a lot of depth at the, at the safety position in particular. There's not a lot of depth at the D tackle and the defensive end position. So honestly, when I'm looking at this entire defense, I'm starting to get a little bit uh, not as optimistic as, <laughs> as I used to be. Like when you really break it down and um, just the depth isn't there. Um, safety position, we got Rodney coming back. You know, who he's going to, I think he's going to start off on PUP on the pup list. And so, mm -hmm. you know, who knows how that's going to happen. You got Anthony Harris, who's played in the league and he's uh -huh. coming over from Minnesota. Um, Marcus Epps is kind of, you know, he's been up and down mm -hmm. type of player. Yeah. He's young, but he can, you know, probably possibly develop and, and help in some kind of way. But really that's it. Um, you know, I don't know much about, um, you know, Kayvon. I, yeah, Kayvon Wallace. I'm sorry. He's a young player. He's, he, he's definitely, he can, he has some ability. He can, you know, if he develops the right way, if he studies film, if he does all the things that we talk about off the field, yeah. he can he can help himself in a big way. But um, in terms of just that's there's that guy in the in the back half. You know, it's it's tough to see, man. It's it's a little disheartening, and, and really, it, it, we, this all goes all the way back to the draft. And you know, we just needed more help in the secondary. Um, yeah, in the draft, and and now we're you know we're getting ready to start the season. And the secondary, I want to say it's it's in shambles, but it's got a lot. They have a lot to prove, and so a lot to prove, yeah, a lot to prove. And so, not saying that they can't do it, but man, 
is it going to be tough? <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> talked about the lack of splash players on defense and a lack of splash players, especially in the secondary besides Darius Slay. And um, and and he's a really, really good, um, good player, still ranked in the top 10 last year, but he struggles against bigger, more physical corners that can move him around a little bit um, and struggle versus some, some, some pretty good ones. Um, but that's normal. Guys struggle with with DK Metcalf and they struggle with Devontae Adams and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, but but he's solid. He's solid by himself. Um, when you consider everyone else, you got a bunch of um, guys that are assignment pure, um, guys that um, are never going to be over, overly talented, guys that are going to be um, – hopefully assignment pure but with besides the the cornerback position the the second corner but when you consider you know Eric Wilson you know a veteran guy you consider Alex Singleton you consider um Fletcher and BG and Derek Barnett that's been around this league and you consider Anthony Harris and Rodney McLeod the thing that you hope is that this is an assignment pure team yes right mm -hmm. so even if they're not Duke or Kentucky when it comes to talent if they're you know a team that's a Princeton offense that can move the ball and doesn't make mistakes, they win a lot of games. Yeah. And that's what I see this team as, as uh, more so lack of talent, but they have enough veterans to be assignment pure. Um, and, and, and assignments will win you games. It's just that when a team is assignment pure against you, and they're more talented. That's when you lose. So I mean, um, you just hope you just hope that um, this team is like just so they play so well together. Yeah, they're gonna have to. I mean, <laughs> our schedule. We got Matt Ryan with the Falcons. We got Matthew mm -hmm. Stafford, the Niners. We got Dak Prescott with Dallas. We got Patrick Mahomes, the Chiefs. Mm -hmm. um, I thought you had Jimmy. Tom G. Brady. Tom Brady with the. Mm -hmm. Am I looking at Priest? I'm looking at – no, yeah. Tom Brady with the Bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's who's uh, quarterback uh, the, the the Panthers? Lions. Panthers. Um, the Darnold. You got Sam Darnold. Oh, you got Darnold. Okay. We'll be all right against him. Yeah, you got Sam Darnold. You got, I believe, Garoppolo. Is it Garoppolo or Matthew Stafford? I can't, I can't remember. Stafford should be in San Fran, right? Sam Stafford's in San Fran. The Lions is Garoppolo. No, um, Lions, the Lions is um, – from LA. yeah, Garoppolo, Garoppolo, we too. Oh, that's right. Because they got. I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got that mixed. Matt Stafford's in. Um, Stafford's in L.A. Right. Yeah. Stafford's um, yeah, in L.A. Stafford. And Go and uh, Goff is in in uh, the the the. the I'm blanking around. The Lions. Yes. There we go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> No, Jared Goff with the line. Jared Goff with yeah, the line. Yeah, Goff with the line. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, a lot of movement. It's going to be movement. a lot. It's going to be a lot. part of the show, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it better right be um, the, <laughs> the, um, but, but I think that with, 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 um, you got a few wins. I believe that you can, you can overcome Garoppolo. Um, I believe that you can overcome Sam Darnold. It's going to be tough versus the, the world champs. It's going to be tough versus Patrick Mahomes. It, you know, you got to overcome pretty quickly. Um, and we just don't stack up with the talent of some of those teams. You can't you can't stack up with the talent of the Chiefs. You can't stack up with the talent of the Buccaneers. You can't stack up with the talent, um, you know, of, of a lot of those teams. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Oddly enough, though, I feel like offensively we'll be okay. I think offensively we'll be okay. I just I just really – how? Why? How? I mean, what has offense well, I, done that says we're going to be okay? <laughs> Fair enough. But I'm just looking. Okay, so you got the Niners. Their defense is, is stellar. Okay, but mm -hmm. you got the Falcons. They're not setting the world on fire. You got the Cowboys. Got a new defensive coordinator, and we we've talked about it. But there's going to be cover three. We know what they're what they're going to be about. You got Kansas City, who's mm -hmm. who's Spagnuolo is doing a great job there. But again, you got Carolina Panthers. You know, new new defensive coordinator or maybe a second year defensive guy. So mm -hmm. I I think it's I think offensively it's in a it's in a better place than what the defense is going to have to deal with. Yeah, I don't know who we made mad in the league offense. <laughs> but, well, yeah, the first couple yeah. the first couple games going to be tough. You guys, you got Dak, right. you got a bunch of guys. Um, yeah. but we'll, we'll see. I'm I'm excited to see Kayvon Wallace to see how he. Um, responds in his second year. He had some playing time. He was very tentative as a player. 
Um, that was my coaching point to him. He was one of my mentees um, was to, to, to go and hit it. Like when you see it, don't just shoot your feet and pat your, you know, you know, you know, guys that just pat their feet. They, they can't process it fast enough. And usually that's younger players. They, they see it, but they just stuck, you know. Yeah. And um, so I, we, we coached him to uh, to let his gun fly. So hopefully um, hopefully he does that this year because um, of safety. You don't want that hesitation. You want that that Q Mike, that Brian Dawkins, that Ryan Clark, that Palomalu type safety. So um <laughs> That's what you want out there. So hopefully he can um, transition into that. Um, yeah, you talked about it. You talked about um, the the schedule coming up. We got some some formidable opponents. Um, we talked about Steven Nelson. Um, let's talk about defensive line, Q. Uh, and I'm going to put that on your plate. Defensive line. We got we got Javon Hargrave that's back. He was hurt last year. Um, you lose uh, Malik Jackson, who was I thought was a very very good player. Yeah. Um, Hassan Ridgeway, you have you have um, Milton Williams, who you draft Marlin, who you draft um, Fletcher Cox. Um, you also got T.Y. McGill, and you also did we say here around Hassan Ridgeway? We did. Yeah. So uh, yeah, um, Willie Henry, Willie yeah, Henry. Willie Henry, and, and, and on, on 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 the edges, um, D. Um, Derrick Barnett, Brandon Graham, Josh Sweat, Brian Kerrigan. What do you see this defensive line? Ron Jackson. Um, yeah. I think I think I think D tackle. Um, we definitely have uh, more. I think we have more depth than um, than it looks at when you first look. And now we we do have two rookies in, in Milton Williams and Marlon Tatu. I can't pronounce his name. Yeah, I'm um, trying. To. You know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> we we do have um, two young players there. We we got. Ridgeway and you have Fletcher Cox. So I think I think defensive tackle wise, I think we're we're fine there. Um mm -hmm. I get a little worried when we go to defensive end. Um only because of, you know, we have Derek Bartnett and we have Sweat who are younger guys, but you know you got BG and, and Ryan Kerrigan who are definitely um, you know, savvy vets, play play lights out, play hard, give you everything they got. But Kerrigan's on year eleven, Brandon's on year twelve. And so you kind of worry about, you know how they'll hold up for an entire season. Um, you know, you got Teron Jackson out of uh, Coastal Carolina, but he's a rookie, mm -hmm. so, you know, you don't know what you're going to get there. And so I think the defensive end position is a little bit in more of um, an unknown area. I think D-tackle, because of the nature of the position, um, I think D-tackle is a little bit better off. But I, mm -hmm. I, I, I am worried a little bit about defensive end position. You know, that's that's a, that's a definitely a, a very important part um, to – to pair with a young secondary that <laughs> with you yeah. know, young players. So I'm a little worried about that. Well, so you have, and, and, and I, and I agree with you. So you have the strength of the defense, which is Javon Hargrave and Fletcher Cox. That's the strength of the team. Um, the strength of strength of the, the entire defense is, is those two guys. Now you got an aging Brandon Graham who showed some signs last year. You got Kerrigan who's older. You got Jess, Josh Sweat who, can't really stay healthy an entire season has knee pro problems right so you got three guys that um that's you know usually kind of hurt and then um you got then you bring in ryan kerrigan who's an older guy so you don't have like that young budding star hopefully um the kid at coastal carolina uh, makes his way into the lineup to, to be able to show some youth there but you got a bunch of um aging veterans and josh sweat being one of the younger men Derek barnett um, who's had who, who's been injury prone a little bit. Yeah. So um, there's not much health at that position. So hopefully we can get a healthy season. But if they're healthy, they're going to be formidable. And our yes. defensive line will be the strongest part of our team. Um, you can never underestimate how many games of football a guy has. Um, that, that'll win you games alone. Um, yeah. Younger players will lose you close games. Older players will win you those games just because okay. they've been in the fire before. And um, so you have guys that 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 um, know how to do that, and we'll we'll look forward to it. The biggest thing is is healthy. Can they stay healthy? You got a yeah. bunch of guys that are older and a bunch of guys that have had some injuries. Can they stay healthy at the defensive end spot? Fletcher Cox goes if Fletcher Cox plays the whole season, doesn't get hurt. You got an opportunity, not chance. But besides Hargrave and Fletcher Cox, there's a big step down after that. When you yeah. start getting into Hassan Ridgeway, you start getting into T.Y. McGill, you start getting – that's a huge step down. So we just got to pray that our older veterans stay healthy. And um, that's the only chance this team has. And 
usually when team when teams are winning, um, people stay healthy. Teams are losing, there's definitely injuries. <laughs> and they, they last longer. <laughs> yeah, right. The injuries tend to, to last longer than normal. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That is crazy. When you win, it's everybody like out there. Yeah, you don't want somebody to take your spot because you don't want to be like, oh, he the reason we win and you're back up. You know what I mean? So you're trying to get back out there. But when you're losing, people just stay in the training room way too long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we'll see, man. I I I um I think I think overall, um, I think this defense is definitely gonna have to rely a lot more on scheme than uh-huh. years past, which I think as a fan of the game and the fan of defense, I'm excited for. I'm excited to see, um, you know, movement in the secondary. I'm excited to see blitz packages. I'm excited to see different um, coverage packages. I'm excited to see that part of the game and and not necessarily what we've had in the past where it's, you know, four-man rush and, uh, you ben know, Badone third, break, third down. Yeah, and third down is line up at the sticks. So I'm excited for that part of it. And, and hopefully um, bringing in a younger coach with a younger mind and, and Gannon kind of brings – some more excitement, at least for me, um, scheme wise to the game. So yeah. I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what we got going. Yeah, um, that's the other point is that you got you got Jonathan Gannon there that's new. Um, I was reading a lot of articles on him and people, you know, comparing him to Mike Zimmer and you know him being able to delegate and and give his younger coaches a voice. I always get very nervous when. Um, I hear that when I hear the defensive coordinator will listen to everyone's ideas. It's kind of hard to say, but usually the best ones are know-it-alls. I don't know what it is about the National Football League, but usually the best offensive coordinators, the best defensive coordinators are guys that know everything. And um, they've seen everything. Like, you couldn't tell Marty Morningwig nothing. He would tell you this in the meeting. I'm 99.9% right. (laughs) And believed it. (laughs) <laughs> and believe it, yeah. right? And, uh, and and you have those bullheaded guys that 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 put that standard out there so high that they meet it with their study, they meet it with their tenacity, um, and, and and figuring out a game plan. So I always get nervous when I hear that I'll, I'll take a little bit from the defensive line coach. I'll hear him, and I'll take a little bit from the linebackers coach. I'm like, yo, that don't sound the best. Um, <laughs> The re- and yes, is there times where you hear everyone's idea and you and you can see? Yes, there are times, but um, I, I I don't I want I want certainty. I don't want like I'm being misinformed. It's like having a boss that's always like, "Hey, what should we do, guys?" Like, no, <laughs> no. This here's the plan. Tell me what to do. Hey, you go over and cook this. You go over and wait the tables. You go over and do this. That's what you want a defense coordinator. And we have a lot of young guys, and hopefully he can um, develop that that skill set because ultimately, um, depending on what the linebacker's word is and what the defense line coordinate um, defense line coach, um, they're not going to get fired faster than you. So you got to make sure that if your neck is on the line, that you have you have the guys prepared. So that's the only thing I'll say about that. I like it. Yeah, yeah that's good. All right, Q, you want to start us off on these questions? These questions. Yeah, let's see what we got today. Oh, this is a good one. Um, <clears throat> so this is from Ryan W. <clears> he <throat> says, my question is about life after football. What is it like to retire in your 30s? I imagine it's hard for a lot of guys <clears throat> that used to, you know, used to be the man and then one day it's over. You know, how do you adjust? Do you get bored? Is it hard to find a new purpose after football? Uh, it's a tough question. It's a tough question. It's it's tough for everybody um, because a lot of times guys identify with it. You've been so good at this for so long. So your teacher, um, my teacher used to treat me like crap when I was a freshman. Then I started going to, going to football as a sophomore. Then my teacher started treating me better. The counselor started treating me better. Um, the principal and so on, because newspapers and cameras and all that type of stuff was the, the, the school was getting attention because of my play. So people begin to treat you a little bit better. And you go to college, you get your name out there and students and, you know, faculty and coaches, everyone treats you better. Um, same way in NFL, you know, so you're used to you, you get a privileged perspective for most of your life, your life. Um, so when the game is done, a lot of guys don't don't know that that privilege was attached to what you did and not who you are. So if you get caught up in the illusion 
of I'm a national um, I'm a player in the National Football League or I'm better than other people or I'm above this and you have a elitist type of mentality, it's going to be very, very hard to overcome um, the time where people don't know who you are. Like I was in Florida this time, first time ever. Um, and I noticed it on where I'm home is that I was in Florida. And it's the first time I've ever traveled that, that I didn't get anyone to stop and say, hey, that was Jason Levant. And I had a mask on most of the time. First time I first time I traveled and I'm going to think and I just going to say, Lord, I thank you because um, I never really bought into the illusion um, because I put on my pants like everyone else. Um, you know, there's no big eyes, no, no, no little use. You treat people like that. And um, if you treat people well, when you're up, when you're in that position, you remember the, the cab driver, you remember the maid, you remember the janitor, you remember the person that's cooking your food, you remember um, the person at a football camp, and you remember their name, what happens is, is that um, people will begin to treat you when no one else, they'll remember things, you know what I mean, and, and it'll come back to you. So um, I just think it's about not falling into the illusion of being this person that's above the law, this illusion of being special, this illusion of that stuff. If you get caught up in the illusion, you're going to crash hard. And um, we see it all the time. Yeah. And to add to that, and, and for me, my experience has been very, very similar to you. I've always I've always had the mindset of, of treating everybody with respect and, and nice. And I'm always smiling and, and a positive person. Um, and my experience wasn't so for me personally, um, you know, the, the transition from playing was very hard. Um, and, and it wasn't so much, it wasn't so much um, that I missed the perks that came with everything. I, for me, it was more, I missed the competition. I missed, I missed breaking down film. I missed studying. I missed, you know, Sundays. I missed the locker room. So like that part it was, was, was hard for me. And I, and I think and I try to explain this to people when people ask me what it's like once you retire, like imagine for me, imagine f from basically your, I was what, 17 years old when I was a freshman in, in, in college. So from 17 to 30, 37, let's say, just to round up, right? That's 20 years of your entire life, right? Being um, committed to a game, right? But not only that, right? Your schedule, schedule wise, like you wake up and everything is kind of scheduled um, mm -hmm. all day, especially in season. Like you wake up, you have to be, it's this meeting, you have to do this, this and that. So there's 20 years of, of living like that and you get used to it. And then you wake up one day after you retire and you wake up and you're just like, well, what, you know? And so it feels like, it, it feels like an emptiness inside and, and mm -hmm. not in a way of like a depression, but it's this emptiness of like, you're so used to just getting up and having so much to do. You're, and then you're, you're regimented. Just, exactly. You're regimented and, and then that's gone. So I think I, me personally, I think that was probably the biggest, the biggest issue I had. And, and me, um, I didn't, I, pro I probably, if I could go back, I probably would have went right into working or right into coaching like right away because that would have taken up all that that empty time that I had. But I said, you know what, I'm just gonna take a little bit of time and enjoy and and I think that made the that made the transition for me a lot more difficult and a lot longer because, you know, I was I took one year off and then I was working with the Eagles and then I was off again. My wife was starting a business. So it was it was a really, really tough time in my life. And I think, you know, right now I'm I'm in a, a much better place. But it was it was very difficult just to to feel that 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 emptiness you know what yeah I mean? it, it is it's, it's probably it's the tough. toughest part it's tough for a lot of guys and we and we pray for those guys it's, it's tough you know because a lot of identity is based in that and it's and it's and it can be sad because there's a lot of forsaking there's a lot of people that were very very close and a lot of these guys felt like they were you know really good friends and when they're done playing it's like oh i can't use you anymore i can't get in the game anymore i can't you know, go, you know, to the short house that you had anymore, you know, whatever it is. And, and, and less devastating for a lot of people because you're going to realize that um, it was a lot of fake people around you. And it's, it's, it's really tough to get over. Um, I think what helped me out was starting launch, launch trampoline park, Denver, New Jersey. Um, I knew that I wanted to do it before um, I got done playing. I was interning while I was playing. So I kind of had an idea of what I was doing in it. And it helped me out a bunch. It really did. It, take, it took my mind off of football. And um, I had offers to go back and play, but my mind was so focused on becoming a businessman that I that I turned it down. Um, so so I, um, 
so so that helped out. I think that you got to have a plan on what you want to do. And there's a lot of guys that are doing good um, uh, around, you know, around, you know, um, retirement. Um, yeah. my, Jamar Adams, they used to play for us is like a, one of the biggest real estate developers um, in New York City. Um, you got Ronnie Brown, who's a financial advisor. You got guys that are doctors now, guys that are actors and models like um, Brandon Boykins, um, Sonora's Mall. Like you got a bunch of guys that are doing really, really well. Um, but then you have your guys that are struggling too. So you just pray for those guys because it's a tough transition and hopefully they can get uh, through. But the good thing about the NFL, there's always continued education through the NFL PA and or the trust or the NFL yeah. So there's always opportunities to go back to school and get better. Absolutely. Yeah. And they do. They do a lot. And, and it never, it, I don't say it never, but it, it didn't used to be that way. Um, yeah. Especially, you know, the, the older generations. Um, and, and the NFL, NFLPA, especially the trust has done a great job. And I've actually been working with the trust. And um, it's one of the, the, the things that a lot of people um, may, may not know about on the outside of the game. But, yeah. uh, you know, the NFL PA and the NFL, you know, they they have all these programs that they put that they put out there for us. And um, it's definitely, definitely a help. So I would say any any former players, if you guys are watching, definitely if you haven't reached out yet, reach out to the, the NFL you know, trust, NFL PA. Yeah, the trust captain for our area is Omar Gate. They're one of our old teammates. Very, yeah. very knowledgeable. OG. Um, yeah, OG, Omar Gate. They're definitely one of the trust captains there. Um, call him about everything. Hey man, what about this? I call him about everything. <laughs> um, uh, let's let's get to the next question. William W. Last week you talked about how talented Mike Vick was. What happened in 2010? The team should have beat Green Bay and went to the Super Bowl. What do you think happened to that team? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I kind of have an idea. It was that was a weird. So you know, after that game, after the 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 Giants game, the, the miracle, of the Meadowlands too. Um, you know, we had we were talking about it before the show. We had we played. I totally forgot. Sometimes like I, I, certain things when I played, I just kind of block out of my mind because I hate to remember mm -hmm. them. But um, you know, we played the Vikings the next week. Um, it was we ended up playing on a Tuesday, and mm -hmm. um, we had the snowstorm and the game. We didn't know if it was going to be played, if it wasn't going to be played, and it ended up being moved to a Tuesday. And then, you know, we ended up finishing losing to um, Dallas. So we finished the game, finished the season on a two game skid, going to the playoffs, not really playing our best football, and lost to the, the Packers, who went on. Who was playing great football. football. They were playing mm -hmm. great football. And, um, you know, what I remember most about those last couple of weeks is just, it just felt, I think that Tuesday game kind of really put us on a bad, on a bad road. Um, when you got, when you come, when you come from such a crazy game, the metal, the, the, the metal lands game, and you go some, from such a crazy high, a lot of times you can go complete opposite the next week. And I think yeah. that coupled with the, the weirdness of playing on a Tuesday and the snowstorm and all that stuff, it just kind of took us off our, took us out of our momentum. Like we've talked about it before. Momentum can be a good thing. It could be a bad thing, right? If you're, if you're having good momentum in, you know, like the, the team that won the Super Bowl that year, they just they hit a tear, they hit a run. It can go the opposite way too. And I kind of feel like that's what happened with us. We had this momentum, we were all the way up here, and then we had a couple bad things happen. Mm -hmm. We had the Tuesday game playing against Joe Webb. And uh, you know, Didn't defensively. He mm -hmm. what's that? Go ahead. Yeah, no, he he had a he had a good game. We were expecting to play far. Uh, Joe Webb gets a start. It was kind of a weird game because he was a running quarterback, and we we were playing we were playing for far. So you know, it was just a weird. This is a weird whole deal. And then you know, we go into the Dallas week, and it just was it was all bad. And I hate thinking about it because that really I felt like that year um, could have been a year we could have really really done some damage. And yeah, just there's there's two teams that I always regret. I regret 2018 where we lost to the um, Cardinals. Um, was that 2008? Yeah, when we lost to the Cardinals. In, no, yeah, in, 2008, in, yeah. And NFC Championship and that team, 2010. Um, and I think about one more. I think about the Chiefs when we lost everybody my last year with the Chiefs in 2014, I believe, 14 or 15 in the playoffs. I think about those three years more so than any because those are opportunities lost. Um, yeah. 
And that game in particular, we were just on too big of a high. And you look at the history of teams that have had an emotional comeback like that, it's in the 80% range of them losing the next game. If you can remember the the um, the Vikings against the Saints where, when Williams made that terrible play and allowed Stephon Diggs to walk into the end zone on the last play of the game and how they got mollywop versus the Eagles the next week. Um, and it was just such an emotional high that it's very, very hard to recover because – the town is like, you're great. You're going to Super Bowl. And there is a such thing as too much praise. Again, yeah. listen mm-hmm. to me. There is a such thing of too much praise. It's all about the fine line of not becoming arrogant and not becoming, um, uh, you know, lost in it, where you're drowning in it, where it's becoming life to you when you forget to respect the opponent. And that's what I think happened to the 2010 Eagles. I believe that we underestimated once we got the nod that Joe Webb was playing quarterback. We were like, oh, we got this game. Yeah. Um, and it's like, who is Joe Webb? You know, there's <laughs> no way Joe Webb is beating us, you know. And um, we we got behind early, and you get get behind on Antoine Winfield. He blitzes. He hits Mike. He does a bunch of different things. Um, it was just it was just too much. I wish we had had a regular game plan where I can be that extra guy in the box to block him. But since we were down and we had to pass, it just left him with a free run to the quarterback, and he was beating line. He was beating you know uh, running back blocks. He was he was just touch. He was sagging, and it made Mike really really uncomfortable. Missed some very very easy throws that game because he was just under pressure all day. So um, I think that we just got lost in the sauce of of um, of, of we got this arrogance, and that happens to teams. It yeah. usually happens to teams with with great comebacks. The Clippers did it this year when they came back. Um, who was that on the? Um, they came back one game versus the Suns, and it was a gigantic comeback. And then the next game, yeah. play like play terrible. It happens every time, yeah. and um, so and it's over and over and over again. So I think that's what happened to us. And uh, and then you know the, the that's, that's why I love Bella, the, 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 that's why I love Pelichick because he keeps his. Yeah. From this perspective, I, I like I always would say Tom is the, is the main ingredient to that whole team, but he makes sure that you respect your opponent. He makes sure that that, that that he's praising the other players so the team don't get the big head. Those are the type of things that most coaches will say. They're pros. They can handle that. No, it's human nature to hear social media. It's human nature to hear ESPN. It's human nature to see, hear all of those things. So you have to counteract that with saying we're bringing up the bad plays. And I always noticed that on our teams, when we play well, the coaches kind of skimmed over the bad plays. Like, oh, it ain't that bad. No, that's that's how most coaches are because you win, everybody feels good, and they're not trying to destroy confidence. But the good coaches curse you out every time because you're playing against the standard. And that's what Belichick has done. That's what Nick Saban has done. They curse guys out after wins because they know that type of play will make will be a loss um, and, it will, and it will equate to a loss. So, so I think that um, uh, that was part of our problem. But go ahead. I'm sorry for cutting you off. Oh, yeah, no, no. Um, and and I was, the only thing I was going to add to that, too, is that year, um, you know, we, we lost to the, the uh, Packers early in the season. I think it was our first game. Yeah. And then we lost to them. Um, at the end of the season. And that year, that particular year, I don't know what it was, but we just could not play well against the Packers. Um, Mike McCarthy. And 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 here's the other thing, too, is there there's certain teams and certain quarterbacks that you just always struggle against. Um, and to me, Aaron Rodgers and Tony Romo were two of the quarterbacks that, at least me personally, as a secondary player, that I always felt that we had um, trouble beating for whatever reason it is. I don't know, you know, maybe they studied us differently. I have no idea, but there was, there, those were the two guys that for some reason we just could not seem to get over the hump on. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it, it came up, it came back to bite us in, in, you know, those last two games that year. And, yeah. you know, and I wanted to add this too, cause I remember I've, I've never actually seen this, but when you it made me think about this one with Belichick and, you know, one thing that I always heard that he did was he'd have a day after the game, or the first day that they come back, whether it's a win or lose, he's got the big board, the big screen, big TV. Everybody's yep. in there. And you you might win the game 40 to nothing. And he's going to pick out plays, whether you're Tom Brady, mm-hmm. whether you're, you know, Gronk, no matter who you are, and he's going to embarrass the hell out of you in front of everybody. And yeah, I, I believe in that. 
Yes, I me too. And and that's how you keep everyone grounded. That's how you keep everyone focused. And you don't want to be on that big board. <laughs> let me tell you what that it. let me tell you what that was though. That was Michigan right there. I'm just gonna keep it 100. Oh, with come you. on, man. <laughs> I'm telling you, doing that Lloyd Carr, Bo Schembechler time, the players were tough as nails mentally. That's the one yeah. thing I can say. So Tom can take that criticism. And you know, and I know, that quarterbacks is as soft as tissue paper. <laughs> and most people, most quarterbacks cannot take that. So therefore, a lot of a lot of teams that I've been on, the court, the coach is always calling the, calling the guy. And you usually um, can never coach your team hard because they don't respect the way you treat the quarterback. So you got to be able to treat the quarterback, and your quarterback had to have tough skin. Yeah. The Vikings game, Quinn Michael with nine tackles, me with two catches, 16 yards. I did nothing. I mean, Mike, <laughs> miss, I did, Mike missed me about four times that game. He was just getting yeah. hit, and uh, it was just off. He was just getting hit, and he, you know, so that was yeah. it. That was a bad yeah. game. I don't want to talk about bad game. All right, all right. <laughs> yeah. all right good Beno. You go ahead and talk about good Beno. All right, let's see. Here we go. Um, good Beno. He says, I love Sirianni and what his offensive uh, scheme could potentially bring to this offense since it's based on yak yards after catch. The Colts were the first in the league in yards after catch completion from pro football reference. <clears throat> and I think that style of offense perfectly fits us since we had Devontae Smith, Jalen Rhaegar, Quez, Miles Sanders, and even Goddard. What do you think is the potential for this wide receiver room in terms of, I, I'm assuming, it all depends on Jalen Hurts, right? So yards after the catch, remember that remember who the coach had last year. You got one of questionably one of the all time greats last year in Phillip Rivers. Um, right on that borderline Hall of Fame guy. But the one thing you can say about Phillip Rivers Rivers is that he's accurate and he throws a catchable ball. And yards after the catch is just as much as the quarterback's accuracy than it is the T receiver's talent. Usually, if the ball is off target, it's behind, it's low, it's up high, there's always a stumble that gives the DB an opportunity to make up the step that he lost at the line of scrimmage. So, therefore, when balls are not on the money, you can't get yards after the catch. But if you can get an accurate quarterback with good ball placement, that's when yards after the catch is created. So, hopefully, we can get keep the quarterback clean. Jalen Jalen Hurts can throw in rhythm, and that's what's going to create yards after the catch. It's not necessarily the players because very rarely do you have those special players that can pick a ball off the ground and stay on his feet. It's just very, very hard to consistently. And usually when that ball is low, your first thing is that the quarterback threw the ball low for some reason, so you go down and you get it. And you don't think about yards after the catch. But if you can be accurate as a quarterback, it helps everything out. And that's the one thing you'll notice about all teams with yards after the catch. They have accurate quarterbacks and they throw timing throws. And um, that's the special. Like when you look at AJ, um, when you look at AJ Brown down in Tennessee, Tannehill has been accurate these last couple of years. He's always leading the league in yards after the catch. Um, and, and that's what it's going to be. Do you have the talent at receiver for, for guys to take it to the house? Yes, you got some talent out there receiver for things to happen. But remember, this is not college. Very rarely does guys take things 60 yards. It may happen in the first couple weeks of the season, but by the middle of the season, you will never see big plays like that. You may see over-the-top bombs down the field, but you rarely see a guy catch a quick screen and take it 50 yards in the NFL. The tackling's too good. Everyone's too fast. They read keys so quickly. So, um, uh, but you got a better opportunity if you hit it at the right time and the ball is accurate. That's the only chance you got in order to get yards at the catch. Yeah. But can our receiver core do those types of things? Jalen Rager is definitely yards after the catch guy. Um, Devontae Smith is definitely that guy. Um, Travis Fogum is a good yards after the catch guy for his size. Um, Quez has made some plays. Um, Quez is going to have to get used to these NFL hits, but we've seen that play he made last year versus the Cardinals, which showed himself very, very elusive on that screen, which can happen. Um, so you've got the right guys there. It's all about the quarterback being accurate. Yeah. And, and you know, to, a lot of times, too, people think, um, you know, accurate means you're putting it in certain spots, which that is part of it. But also accuracy comes from knowing where, the holes are going to open up, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing and being able to read coverage and understanding what, what you're seeing in front of you and knowing where the holes are going to pop open. And, you know, that's yeah. one of the things. I mean, obviously, Phillip Rivers has played in the NFL for a long time. And so when you compare, you know, it's tough to compare, you know, Phillip Rivers with all experience and, and, and um, you know, knowledge that he has for the game to a, a guy like Jalen Hurts. So, um, you know, I, I, 
I agree with you 100 percent on that. I, I think yeah. I think if it's gonna happen, if the yards after the catch are gonna come, it's gonna come from broken plays. It's gonna come from plays where mm. Uh, guys are staying. Receivers are staying with with Jalen as he's breaking the pocket, and uh, he's he's getting out of the pocket and he's creating with his legs, and he's got his eyes downfield and he finds someone. So he I think the yards out of the catch are going to come from those type of plays instead of you know the on timing, throw it in the accurate areas. But hopefully, yeah. um, hopefully I'm wrong. So yeah, I see it. the harder the guy throws, the more accurate they have to be, because guys that throw pillows. It's an inviting catch for a receiver. Mm -hmm. And this is what fans don't know. Kurt Warner, all of his receivers had 1,000 yards the year we played them in the NFC Championship game. Steve Breston had 1,000 yards. Then Quan Bolden had 1,000 yards. Larry Fitzgerald had 1,000 yards. Very rarely, rarely does that ever happen. The reason it happened is because Kurt Warner throws pillows. And he throws it on time. He throws air under the ball. He knows which window is going to be open. He knows where you're supposed to be, and he's not trying to throw the ball through you. When you throw, when you have a guy that throw the ball really, really hard, guys that don't have elite hands get defensive in their catches, and usually they end up going away from the ball like that. Um, they start bodying the ball a little bit more. Now there's a time and a place to body the ball. Bodying the ball is good if there's multiple defenders around you over the middle of the field, but it's very, very hard to get yards of the catch when you're bodying the football unless you it catches you right in stride. So um, – the pillow throwers are usually going to be guys that um, are great. At your, and if you if you do throw the ball hard, you got to be really accurate. So you got to be Josh Allen that throws the ball really, really hard, but he's accurate. And he can yeah. fit it through stuff, but he's accurate. So, um, you know, that's my two cents on that as well. Man, in that game, <laughs> this brought back a memory of, of Kurt Warner. Jim Jim Johnson sent me on the same blitz like three, <laughs> three yeah, times in a row. You remember all Ray Lou blitzes? And they would what oh. they would do is they would split out the tight end so mm -hmm. they, they would see me coming, and I'm gonna sit on my gym. Like Jim, they, they, they know this is coming. coming. <laughs> so he, Kurt, he starts his cadence, and he's just looking right at me, like, "All right, I know you're coming," yeah. and I'm trying to disguise it. And he's so like, they send the motion. He's like, "All right, here we go, out the gate, like out the gate." Damn, it was strange. It's crazy. <laughs> that was fun times, though, man. Yeah, that it was, was fun times. Yeah, that was that. That, that was that was that Quinn Dempsey game right there where he was getting pieced up. Oh yeah, that game. Yeah, that was a that was a that was a tough game right there for him. Yeah, and it was tough because you had you and you had Constantine. You should have been sticking with one of the veterans. You put the rookie in there and, and the big. That's why I'm not a big fan of putting rookies in situations um, when the game's on the line. Oh, so that's tough. Yeah, you can't you tough. can't put them in a game like that. That's and tough. a in a one on one situation down the field with Larry Fitzgerald, <laughs> you just can't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. We want to <laughs> win. All right, last question. Dave from South Carolina, what do you believe makes a complete wide receiver core and what makes a complete DB core in the NFL? You can speak to, to either one of them. He's a fan. Um, so to me, defensive defensive back wise, um, to me, the, the most important thing is co good communication. Um, guys that are able to work together, study, film together, um, talk together um, and, and really understand how you play as a unit. So mm -hmm. that's probably to, to me the most important part. And then to me, I like you got to have you got to have a corner that obviously we say it all the time. You got to have a corner that that has dog in them, that will take chances, that is aggressive, that will tackle. You know, you got to have at least one corner that's willing to do the dirty work. Um, yeah. You have to have a smart you have to have a smart safety and both of them, both of your safeties need to be able to hit. And then your other corner, in my opinion, you need to have another corner that is athletic and understands that he's a number two, right? He's the number two corner. He's not the number one corner. So for me, if you get, uh, if I had the perfect secondary, it would be, I'd have to have one corner that's aggressive, plays off the ball, um, plays with good eyes, but will take chances and, and make plays. Got to have two safeties that are willing to tackle and do the dirty work, communicate well. And I got to have a corner that understands his role, plays his role, loves his role. Sheldon and Brown. work together. Yes, absolutely. Sheldon Brown, right? One there. of the one of the most underrated corners that that has graced the Eagles is Sheldon Brown. What a steal. I mean Oh my goodness. He, he was dynamic. I used was, to love Sheldon Brown, man. Yeah. I mean he, he taught was, me so much about the game. Yeah. And and that, you know, that we talk about all the time. That was one of the most underrated things that I learned. I learned that as a young guy. Just watching Sheldon, 
you guys go against go against each other one on ones, and he's telling yeah. you, "Hey, you you do this, you do." This. And then when in, in turn, what that does happen is now you you take that knowledge that you learn from him, and you can teach those guys. And so yeah. that's what we talk about when you're talking about building a program and building a team. Is that it's not about bringing in mercenaries all the time. It's about starting. That's where you build from the draft, and you start mm -hmm. from the draft, and you build it that way. And that's you know that's what I think a lot of teams have gotten away from. But I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, you're I'm good. A little bit. No, you're good. I, I was adding to it. So <laughs> what makes a complete receiver core? Um, I just think that you need dogs at receiver. Um, you got a bunch of pan, man be pan be football players and especially <laughs> receivers. Um, what makes it hard for teams is that you got guys that just refuse to go in and block, which makes it hard because now um, it's a dead giveaway when a plays a run. It's not team football. Guys are just selfish. They just want the ball all the time. So you need, even if they're prima donna, they got to be dogs. And they got to be guys that want to compete, that will block their butt off like DK Metcalf. Yeah. Guys like that, that may want the ball a lot, but he's going he's gonna to contribute in the run game. So if you can get a team of three, three guys like that, that is willing to sacrifice themselves because there is like little plays that win and lose you game. You know, the Eagles were awful at bubble screens and stuff like that. And we got small guys like that. The reason is, is because you have a bunch of guys that are that last year that were soft, a bunch of guys that were rookies, a bunch of guys that were light and weight. You need a bunch of dudes that are willing to be dogs and take their pride. Like when I was at Blocker, I remember getting Jeremy Macklin hit one time versus the Falcons. And I just blew the assignment. And I just remember to myself like that will never, ever happen to me ever again. And I probably missed all of four or five assignments in my pro career and all of maybe, you know, four or five in college. I just had that much um, hunger to want to, 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 to make sure my team was dependent on me. And that just takes pride and dog. And uh, so if there's a bubble screen and you know, you got guys with yards after the catch, you can't have yards after the catch. And then there's guys that can't hold up on the secondary. We played Mike Hilton last year and he lived in the backfield. We play guys like that. You got to be able to stop the penetrator and we have light guys. So that's what hurts our team. So we don't have a complete receiving core because we got a bunch of guys that are too small to be able to do some of the dirty work that you need in order to win. But the perfect receiving core is a guy with the mentality that, OK, I have a big play guy. I have a grease guy. I call him I always say a grease guy, a guy that can you can put the ball in their hands. Um, and you just have like a serial competitor, the guy that's a great route runner. So if you can have one of those three, like a grease guy, a great route, great route runner and a dynamic playmaker, and all of them are willing to be a part of the team. And when it comes to running the football and, and that type of stuff, it's contagious. When the receivers go out and, and, and handle business back in those times where we used to get in fights with everybody, I used to try to pick fights. We used to pick fights with people. You remember that stuff on the sideline. Yeah, we used to pick fights with people because it gets the offensive line height. Ty Hammers come back, RJ, RJ, <laughs> because we set the tone because we make a play. And, and, and it's instant offense because I'm a firm believer that you create energy by um, of positive affirmations, little things that you do. You know, good job, Ty. Man, you, your, your spat looks great. Whatever it is, block yeah. it. Whatever yeah. it is, when you, when you see that participation like that, good energy is going to happen. Those plays are going to be made because you have – it, you have freed yourself from the selfish ambition that this game tries to weigh you down with. And guys that are about the team, they make more money. Yeah. They um, are better for the team. And um, you look like a guy like Rashawn Woods. Rashawn Woods is just a team guy. He does everything that they ask him to do. This dude's making a lot of money. And he's not the most talented guy, but he's a team guy. And they, they value that. Um, so you just need guys like that to have that, that, that bought in mentality. And I, so I say – a dynamic playmaker, a route runner, and because the route runner is going to be going to be key for critical situations, third mm -hmm. down, fourth down, so on and so forth. The grease man is going to be key for first and second down, trying to get the ball in his hands to be able to score a big one. So, um, and then a dynamic playmaker can be on first and second down as well. Okay. Yeah, I like it. That's yeah, grease man. Oh, just the grease. I like that. The grease yeah. man. <laughs> yep. Oh, it's just okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can dig that one. Yeah. So Q, that's wrapping us up for tonight. Q, it's always a great time being with you, my brother. It's always um, a pleasure to talk and hear everything that you, um, you all the insight, man. I, I learned a bunch from you. Um, thanks for the, the insight into the secondary tonight. 
to all the fans that are out there. Continue to send your questions to inside the birds at gmail.com. Check us out on uh, Inside the Birds YouTube channel, Amazon Music, Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter. We appreciate you guys for tuning into the show. I always give Q the last words, and I just want to say good night to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, as always, great time again, man. Um, I, I, agree, I agree. I always learn something from you. Um, I'm stealing that, the Greece guy, the Greece man <laughs> from you. I like that. But no, man, it's, it's always fun. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoy these times and appreciate it, man. It's good stuff. Always. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Fans. <laughs> Peace. Right.